you know, I, I was thinking about the last couple of days, this question of the reviving the American Revolution. And I, I think it's very useful to reflect on what power the idea of the American Revolution had in Europe at the time when we were consolidating our Constitution, when Hamilton was pulling the nation together with his reports. And so I thought it, it would be useful to take a look at this period of uh, the Weimar classics when you had Mozart alive, uh, Schiller alive, and Beethoven just beginning to emerge as a leading figure in art and culture in Europe. Because what all of them were inspired by was this potential that came out of the American Revolution. And, of course... As you know, the American Revolution was not something born in America, but it actually goes back to Nicholas of Cusa and this idea that in order to realize a world of sovereign nations, you had to get outside of Europe, that Europe was dominated by the oligarchy in the 15th century, uh, as it was still at the end of the 18th century. And so how can you have sovereign republics when you have monarchies? when you have power in the hands of nobility. And so the, the problem that was posed for people in Europe was, could you bring the ideas of the American Revolution to Europe? Whereas in the United States, the lacking of feudal nobility, lacking a, an, an oligarchy, the question for Americans uh, at the time of the American Revolution is, can we break effectively from Europe. And the reason I think this is useful is what we're doing today is we're seeing, in a sense, the idea of the American Revolution and Hamiltonian credit, at least an outline with the BRICS, while in the United States, and, and I would argue also Canada, you have a domination of, of the imperial economic system, which is essentially a looting system, not just looting developing sector countries, but also the advanced sector now and the U.S. and Canada. So this idea of the transatlantic alliance is crucial today because we have to bring American system policies back to the United States, but they are now in embryo form at least, and in some cases more filled out than that, in the BRICS countries. So it's worth then seeing why it is that it takes a unique quality of, of intervention, such as that of the Schiller Institute, to accomplish this. Because we're not just talking about good economic policies. You know, if you sit down a bunch of economists and say, would it be a good thing to have high-speed rail, all other things being equal, if you could have credit, if you had a labor force, very few would disagree with that. Some would. But most would say, well, high-speed rail will help cheapen produ uh, production, uh, improve in of infrastructure, always is good for the economy. If you said, would it be good to have 10 million new manufacturing jobs and construction jobs in North America? Who could disagree with that? But the problem is we're not just talking about simple economics. We're talking about a change in the way people think about what is important in human life. What should humans endeavor to accomplish in their life? And that's why it's always useful to look at, at some of the greatest minds who are dealing with these questions to get some insights into how to organize the people that we're talking to. And look, we're, we're talking, we always talk to everyone when we organize, but we're looking for specific types of people, those people who can grasp ideas and the importance of ideas, not just you know, the average Joe who's pissed off and wants to kick the queen in the ass. You know, you, you've got to find people who are capable of higher quality of thinking. Now, this is not elitist. This is the only way you can organize a movement. Because right now in the United States, you have millions of people who are pissed off. People who have bad jobs, people who are one paycheck away from losing their home kids that can't get out of their parents' house because they, they're saddled with college debt and no jobs. And there are a lot of people who are, would be willing to go out and kick somebody. 
But you don't just want to organize people around rage. You have to organize them around a higher conception. And so I, in thinking about this question of, of what does Beethoven represent, you know, I, I came to this idea of the confluence of, of thinkers in Vienna and Germany at the time of the American Revolution. And this was near the end of Mozart's life. Uh, Mozart had been there in Vienna from 1782, and at the time the Emperor Joseph II was co going through a whole series of reforms. And these reforms were along the lines of what you would call American system type reforms. Freeing the peasantry, uh, uh, taking education away from the church and establishing a secular educational system, but also inducements for through credit for new entrepreneurship, um, trade tariffs to protect Austrian or, or Habsburg industry. He was doing things that were somewhat along the lines of what was being done by Hamilton at that same time in, in America. But by, 18, by 1785, 1786, the impulse for that was wearing down. The reaction to the American Revolution uh, in Europe had grown. There was a, a recognition in uh, the British in particular that you would better make sure that you don't have an American Revolution that spreads to Europe. Now, Mozart was still quite optimistic in 1785, 1786, he wrote The Marriage of Figaro, which is a beautiful opera, which essentially tells the story of the servants making fools out of the noblemen and essentially organizing to uh, achieve a certain degree of respect and dignity from the oligarchy, but it assumed at the end, somewhat optimistically, that maybe the count could change. Now, Don Giovanni, a year later, assumes that the oligarchy can't change, and the only way to deal with Don Giovanni is to have something from outside of man, God, come down and, and seize him, you know, destroy him. But the people remain the same. You can see a little pessimism in Mozart, because the very end, Leporello, the servant, for example, says, well, I'll just go out and find a new master, hopefully a better one. The peasants, uh, Zerlina and um, her new husband, say, now we'll just go home and have dinner and make babies. So there was no transformation. And by the time you get to Cosi Fan Tutte, the last of the three operas, collaboration of Mozart and De Ponte, what you see is life is trivial, it's banal. Uh, people are acting foolishly. The question of love is, can you switch partners and find out that all women are like that, all men are like that? Mozart had gotten somewhat cynical because the, the Josephine reforms had collapsed and there was a reaction setting in. And what happened? The Austrians went to war against the Turks in 1788, 1789. Joseph died. His brother Leopold came in, but he was completely surrounded by a revived aristocracy. And this is just as Beethoven first came to Vienna. The first time he came to Vienna, he went to see if he could study with Mozart. And Mozart at the time was so involved, he was writing the Requiem, the Magic Flute, the Clemenza de Tito, uh, the Clarinet Concerto. He just didn't have time, but he, he heard Beethoven play. And he said to people, this man is going to amount to something. Keep an eye on him. But by the t and then Beethoven's mother got sick and he had to go back to Bonn. And by the time he returned to Vienna, Mozart was dead. 1791. And Mozart's collaborators were on the defensive. The uh, new emperor was Franz by 1793. Franz was controlled by the oligarchy completely. In 1793, a decision was made to ban Schiller's works in Austria, a ban that lasted for 15 years. So at the time of the death of Mozart, and the emergence of the, the Emperor Franz, you had an Austrian police state. You'd also had the French Revolution, 1789 to 92, with the slaughter 
that convinced the oligarchy in Austria they needed a police state to prevent against this. You know, Beethoven wrote a letter to a friend in 1794. He was now in Vienna. And he wrote a letter in which he said, you dare not raise your voice here or the police will take you into custody. I mean, interestingly, the, the week or two weeks after Mozart's death, the Baron von Sweeten, who was the person who introduced Mozart to Bach's works at his salon in 1782, von Sweeten, who was one of the chief reformers, was put in jail. So there was a crackdown, a shutdown. And it looked as though the American Revolution tendency in Austria was going to be routed and crushed. Now, this is the period that uh, when Beethoven first discovered Schiller. And one of the best ways to look at this, how this artistic collaboration on the principle of the, the higher nature of man is to look at the setting of Schiller's poem on Die Freude to music, which Beethoven actually started with in 1793. Uh, Schiller wrote the poem in 1785. It was published in 1786. Uh, and then in 1803, he revised it. But the original poem, The Ode to Joy, was studied by Beethoven in 1793. And we have a letter, I'll just read you the quote, from one of Schiller's friends, a man named Fischenich, uh, Bartholomeus Ludwig Fischenich. And he wrote a letter to Schiller's wife uh, from Bonn, which is where Beethoven was living at the time. And he said, I'm enclosing, what he's saying, he's, he's sending a, a setting of a poem that she would know that he'd like to get their opinion. And then he said, it is by a young man of this place whose musical talents are universally praised and whom the elector has sent to Haydn in Vienna. Because Beethoven, when he went back to Vienna, Mozart was dead, but he studied with Haydn. And Fischenich goes on to say, he proposes also to compose Schiller's Freude and indeed, strophe by strophe. I expect something perfect, for as far as I know him, he is wholly devoted to the great and the sublime. So 1793, Beethoven first takes up the challenge of the Schiller poem, uh, The Ode to Joy. Now, a few years later, he put it aside, and he wrote to Czerny, who's another musician, who was involved with setting of, of Goethe's poems in particular. And Beethoven wrote to him, Schiller's poems are very difficult to set to music. The composer must be able to lift himself far above the poet. Who can do that in the case of Schiller? In this respect, Goethe is much easier. Now, don't take that as too much of an attack on Goethe, because Beethoven liked Goethe's poetry but he didn't like his politics. And this is crucial. There's the famous story of Beethoven and Goethe on the street together in Weimar. And the Duke, Archduke Karl, goes by in a carriage. And Goethe takes off his hat and bows to the ground. Goethe worked for the, the Duke. And Beethoven just stood there with his hands on his hips and said, what are you doing? And Goethe supposedly said, well, this is my boss. And Beethoven said, we Republicans don't bow to noblemen. Now this idea of the American Revolution burned deeply in Beethoven. Now through this period of time when Schiller was censored, Beethoven was doing some interesting works. I mean, it was in this period when he first composed Fidelio, 1806-1807. But you had, at that time, the French Revolution was taken over by Napoleon. And there was a brief moment where the word was that Napoleon is the continuation of the American Revolution. It's the end of the empire, the end of the nobility. Uh, and of course, what they came to find is that Napoleon was, in fact, an extension of the same imperial system, only this time it would have been under France rather than Britain. And in fact, the British were encouraging Napoleon to go east. So it became very clear that 
this tendency was lost. And Beethoven went into a kind of depression for a period of time through the, the middle part of the, or the, from 1810 to about 1818. Uh, but it's interesting, one of the things that he did in 1809 when the censorship was lifted, so Schiller had been censored from, eight, from 1793 to 1808. 1809, as soon as the censorship was lifted, Beethoven ordered the complete works of Schiller from the publisher Breitkopf and Hertel. And he started reading and studying Schiller. And this had a profound effect on Beethoven. Now, Beethoven never met Schiller, but he was familiar with his works from a young age because uh, one of their common friends was a man named Johann Andreas Streicher. And Streicher was a piano maker. But as a young man, he had been at the same military academy as Schiller. And in 1782, when Schiller's first play was performed, The Robbers, it was performed in Mannheim, and Streicher and Schiller escaped the military school and traveled by foot and coach to Mannheim to be there for the opening of the play. And The Robbers was, of course, a revolutionary play. It challenged the oligarchy. It, it really uh, it inspired people on these higher ideals, the nobility of the individual human being, the beautiful soul. And Schiller nearly was thrown in prison for going to Mannheim, for leaving the, uh, the military academy, but also for writing the play. And poets in that time were jailed. And so this convinced Schiller that he better be careful, but it never stopped him from pursuing this idea about the inherent dignity and, and nature of man. Now, Streicher became friends with Beethoven in the mid-1790s. And he and Beethoven would sit down and talk about Schiller's works. Now, you have to think back, at the same time this was going on in Vienna, who was Schiller talking to in the, the 1790s? He, he was meeting with uh, Goethe, but also the von Humboldts. So he had these collections, these, these uh, groupings of serious intellectuals who were taking up this question of how do we transform the human race using poetry, plays, music. And imagine had they been able to work together, had you had a situation where without police state threats, Mozart could have had enough income so he would have been able to take care of himself. That Mozart and Schiller and Beethoven and Goethe and the Humboldt brothers and others would have been able to work together. As it was, they couldn't, but they, in a sense, they were working together. And this is where you see the importance of Beethoven thinking for all these years about the setting of Andi Freude. Now, I want to just give you a couple of other indications of the parallels between the thinking of Beethoven and Schiller. And obviously, you know, uh, Beethoven often quoted Don Carlos, the, the play um, by Schiller. He saw himself a little bit like Don Carlos, a man of hot blood. You know, hot blood runs in my veins, he wrote in someone's notebook uh, uh, but I want to give you a couple of quotes to give you a sense of the, the parallel in their thinking. Schiller was, of course, as a Republican and a Platonist, very much uh, worried about popular opinion and worried about it not because he wanted to propitiate it, but because he realized this was an impediment to the kind of thinking that was necessary. And so he, he wrote in one of his letters to Kerner, the majority is nonsense. You know, because Kerner was saying, well, most people don't understand what we're saying. And he basically said, so what? The majority is nonsense. We have to educate those who will move and, and, and carry out these kinds of fights. Uh, Beethoven, uh, in a comment to one of his friends at one point, said, 
They say, Vox Populi, Vox Dei, that the voice of the people is the voice of God. And he said, I never believed it. So you had this common sense, uh, real common sense of the, the Republican ideal. Now, this carried over into another important thing, important for us to think about, which is, how do you change a society? You know, remember, both in the case of, of Schiller, who was constantly under threat uh, of censorship uh, in Germany, his works were censored in Austria. Mozart was constantly uh, uh, being threatened by elements of the oligarchy. Beethoven was having problems with that. It would seem that their fate was that they would not succeed with their highest aspirations. And this is where you see the higher quality of character that existed with them. Uh, you know, Beethoven often quoted from the Iliad, something Homer wrote, fate gave man the courage to endure. Now, and when Homer's writing it, it's the idea that your fate is to be better. So in the case of the Iliad, you have uh, uh, Ulysses, who's spending years, or I'm sorry, the, 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 the Iliad, uh, it, it, the, the reference is not to Ulysses, but this idea that you had to camp out for 10 years before you could win the war. But the idea that if you know that there's something better, then you can endure the hardships day to day. You can overcome them. Now, uh, what, and Beethoven quoted that. The other quote from Beethoven on free will rather than fate, and I really like this one. He said, I will seize fate by the throat, uh, and it, it shall certainly not bend and crush me. So again, the idea that there's no higher power than the will of the human being to achieve something better. Now, Schiller said, let evil destiny show its face. Our safety is not in blindness, but in facing our dangers. You know, this common idea for the two of them, which you see quite often. And I, I have another quote here from both of them that, that, on how to deal with the power of evil. Um... Beethoven wrote, All evil is mysterious when viewed alone. It is all the more ordinary the more one talks about it with others. It is easier to endure because that which we fear becomes totally known. It seems as if one has overcome some great evil. So by making these things a, a, a subject of discussion, you overcome them. And then Schiller had a, a, a similar conception, and this has to do, I, I think this is from his theater as a moral institution. He writes, man rises above any natural terror as soon as he knows how to mold it and transform it into an object of his art. So by putting in front of you that, what you, that which you fear, this comes from Lessing in the Laocon, you know, this, this idea that you... You strengthen your courage by realistically assessing and understanding that which you fear. And then Beethoven takes us another step further. He says, live only in your art. That is the only existence for you. So this idea that it's through art and beauty that man can be uplifted to face the evil, to face the fear, to take on what seems to be the impossible. Now, all of this is in a context of growing police state. You know, Schiller dies in 1805. Uh, by 1815, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there is a crackdown again in Europe with the Congress of Vienna. And the crackdown included in 1817 something called the Carlsbad Decrees, which, which once again outlawed Schiller. So here you have, after Schiller's uncensored in 1809, less than a decade later, he's on the censored list again. 
and uh, as well as any meetings of, of Republican groupings were disallowed. So there was a total crackdown. Now, at this point, what does Beethoven do? He ordered the, the 21 volumes of Schiller's works, and I think he had to go to Germany to get them. So he had them delivered to him. His nephew went out and got them. His nephew, Karl, was someone who loved Schiller. And he brought the 21 volumes to Beethoven. This is 1824. Beethoven, at this point, has finally decided how to set the An die Freude. So 21 years after, or is it 31? It's 31, 1893 to 24. That's 31 years of this rattling in his head. How do you, he wanted to do the whole poem. He didn't want to cut it. And he wasn't quite sure how to set it. So what did he do? He puts it in a symphony as the final movement of a symphony. Now it's conjecture, conjecture rather. Why did he do that? And one can look at the fact that one of the things Beethoven was reading in the early 1820s was The Bride of Messina, Schiller's last play, which has an, a preface on the role of the chorus. And of course Schiller is writing about the Greek chorus but it's about how you present an idea outside of the body of the work that includes, you know, sort of the vox populi, because the chorus is often, as in Prometheus Bound, the chorus is fearful. The chorus is arguing with Prometheus, you know, do what they want, don't suffer. But Schiller uplifts the chorus to say that it's not just about the fears, it actually is to make the audience conscious of the broader subject of the drama. And if you think about then Beethoven taking a poem and saying, let's, let's put this as a chorus in the Ninth Symphony. And so 31 years of work and thinking and many starts, there are many sketches. If you, if you actually, you may even be able to find this on Google. Uh, early sketches of the Ode to Joy. Beethoven in 1808 almost had what he thought was complete. If you know the choral fantasy, some of the music there is very similar to the theme of the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony, and I think that was 1806. So these ideas were, were there. But what's the principle? The, what comes out in that is this idea all men are brothers. And that this is the Beethoven's most profound expression in music of taking a poem. And, and remember what he said, to set something to music, you have to be above the poet. And this is Beethoven thinking that after all this work and all this time, he could do something that would lift the work above the, the power and the beauty of Schiller's poem. Now, I'm compressing a lot of history in, into this discussion, this relationship. But I, I think the important thing is to realize that what were you dealing with in that period from the middle of the 1780s through the end of Beethoven's life, 1826 or 27? What are you dealing with? The American Revolution was successful. It was almost derailed by the Articles of Confederation. It was in this period that Beethoven was writing his, his late quartets. And there's this famous story of uh, several friends of his coming by to play them. And, of course, Beethoven is completely deaf by that time. And he's sitting there in the room, and these four musicians are playing, and all of a sudden he looks up, and they're, they're just sitting there somewhat stunned. They've stopped playing. And so Beethoven says to them, what's the problem? And one of them said... We don't understand this. And Beethoven said, oh, don't worry, it's not for you, it's for the future. And so this idea of a commitment to the future, a commitment to the most profound ideas, what Schiller talks about, the ennoblement of the individual human soul as the basis of the advance of the whole civilization, that's what drove Schiller, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, it was saved by Schumann, 
through his work. And that's what Lin says was killed after Brahms. The empire knew that they had to suppress this idea of beauty. And so I think it's worth going back to that and thinking about what it is that Helga saw in Schiller that became the basis of the Schiller Institute and our fight to actually establish a new paradigm based on this higher conception of man. So that's, that's what I wanted to just uh, present to you this evening and see if there are any questions on it. Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, hi, this is Dave. Uh, I've, there's many questions that uh, could be asked, but I've wondered partly because we're talking about, uh, in a sense, how there was such a high level of culture, in a sense, among these groupings, uh, you know, in Vienna uh, and whatnot, but what, because we talk about how degenerate our population has become, but was there not that same type of degeneration generally, would you say it was of the same uh, level back then as well, but you just happen to have this, this uh, very high level grouping or like, it, I'm just trying to think of some parallels because yeah, it's amazing what this grouping of people did. Well, you had some unique geniuses, but they had the same problem. I mean, Mozart, at the very end of his life, Mozart decided that you couldn't change Vienna by changing the nobility because he tried that. You know, most of the early operas were performed in the, the Imperial Theater, the Imperial Opera Company, and they were aimed at the nobility. Because Joseph was trying to change the nobility, to rein them in, but to get the best of them to become part of his reforms. By 1787-88, it became clear that wasn't going to happen. You had a degeneration in Vienna among the oligarchy. And so Schikanator, who was a, 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 a performer who had a theater troupe, but who was part of this broader network they wanted to use a national theater in the German language to uplift people. He was trying to bring, he was bringing Shakespeare's plays in German as part of the Lessing project with the national theater. He uh, got to know Mozart in 1780 in Salzburg where his theater troupe spent the summer and, and Mozart went three nights a week to the theater and then Schikanator had dinner with the Mozart family. Uh, Ten years later, Schikanator bought a theater, but a big theater. And he said to Mozart, perform the magic flute in this theater. You'll have many, many people who will come to see it. And so Mozart was beginning to think, how do we take these great ideas and this powerful music to uplift people? And so, you know, did it have an effect? Well, obviously it did. But you were up against, at that point, uh, a defeated reformer grouping, group of reformers, and a reaction in Europe directed by the British, but enforced by the Habsburgs through Metternich. You know, it was a total police state. Vienna was a, a nest of spies. Now, you think about it today, first of all, we don't have the great geniuses, and we have to create them. You know, part of our job is to restore this classical tradition. You know, there are good singers, but do they understand what they're singing? There are people who can write, but you know, can they write beautiful poetry? Or do they just do slam poetry? You know, it's shock poetry. So we have to restore this tradition. But at the same time, we have this wealth of, of beautiful material. It's available. I mean, the one thing about it, the classics is that they provide you with time-tested material that can give you uh, an ability to uplift people. But we've got to put them in the context and let people know what they, what they really represent. Now, then that brings up the question of what's the relationship of this to politics? And this is where you get to the bricks. The Lynn's idea of what the bricks represent, and Helga's idea of the new paradigm, is Schiller's notion of man and Hamilton's 
notion of physical economy, because Hamilton's notion of physical economy is based on a concept of productivity, which comes out of creativity and a credit system that will fund creativity. And that should include in the arts. But if we can get to the point where we, we break the power of this oligarchy, think of what that means for culture. I mean, our culture is so terrible right now. You, you have, you know, I, I just did a presentation at the Seattle BRICS conference earlier today via Skype, mm -hmm. and there were about 15 people who were 65 or older, and about three younger people. And I talked to the older people about their responsibility to take their experience of what it meant to live in an economy that had industry to the young people. But What's the culture that the young people have today? It's social networking, it's Instagram, it's Facebook. So, you know, we've, it's through a change in the economy that people can begin to see that they have a future, that they become less interested in their immediate concern about what their friend is doing at this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you think about it, Facebook and, and, and these things, uh, MySpace, they're so self-delusional. Do you really think your friends want to know where you are every minute of the day? <laughs> and I, I had a funny story from Ed Asner. Uh, he was telling me that he had a couple friends who were sending out to all their friends where they were going. And among their, their people who friended them were crooks who would follow their postings to see when they were leaving town and go rob their house. So, you know, this self-indulgent mentality of our current culture, uh, it would change if we change the, the concept of economics. And I think we have to fight for the two at once, but if people actually have a sense that there is a future, same way Beethoven said, it's not for you, it's for the future, that we're creating a better world for the future. And people who are, are living now know that, then you create the potential for a real revival of the classics, a real renaissance. That's sort of a long answer, but I, I think, hope yeah. that gets at what you were thinking yeah, about. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Harley? Yeah. I, uh, I had this question. I, I had asked this once before to somebody else, uh, Dennis Speed, uh, but I, I didn't quite fully, super understanding, I suppose, or, of the answer. But anyway, the... Um, when I listen to the, the Ninth Symphony, and you know we're all very familiar with the, the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony, but um, I couldn't figure out particularly what it was that drove Beethoven to compose the first three movements the way that he did that had very little relationship, it seems to me, with the, the fourth spectacular one where all the voices come out. And uh, I mean, I always found it to be quite anomalous in particular that it, you know, you've got this a very different mode that he's in, which is sometimes almost hard to listen to. Like, it lacks the density of singularities and, and themes that you, you see coming out in the, at the end. So I was wondering, why do you think he did that? Well, this is where, if I were there and had the transparencies I have, I could show you. <laughs> Every theme, the leading themes of the first three movements are all in the fourth movement in the beginning. They're all there. Uh, they're there in a slightly altered way, but this is the idea of thorough composition. Now, as you're listening to that, you have a shift where it goes into the choral part. But it's announced by the saying, not these tones. You know, where Beethoven is, is essentially saying, Okay, now we've seen where we've got what it took to get here, but where is it we really want to go? And you know, you have the the opening then, Freude, uh, you know, where you have a, a somewhat jarring opening to the after you have the not these tones, you, you have a somewhat jarring, and then almost a a kind of a march, and then a kind of in the middle of it, a contrapuntal march, the Turkish march, that comes in. And, you know, what he's basically doing, I think, is 
demonstrating the principle of thorough composition, but then also how you can take any composition and move it into a still higher realm, which was his thinking about what was unique about Schiller's poem and the difficulty in composing, uh, making it uh, a musical composition. You have to go into something higher, but even within something higher, you can bring in something that's semi-whimsical, but completely coherent. You know, that Turkish march in the middle of it. That's sort of the microcosm and the macrocosm, that you can incorporate almost anything, including a, a Turkish march with different instruments. You still have me there? Yeah. 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 So that you can still have that keeping the one. Because that, yep. yeah, that, that gives me a new outlook to listen to it again. But if you if you look at the, just take the music of the themes that open the first three movements, and then look at the fourth movement, how it starts. They're all there, and then you have the voice come in, and it's a decisive shift. It's an upshift, you might say. Hmm. Thanks. I'm going to have to run because I I've got, you know I. This is the kind of thing I, I love to do. I'm sorry I didn't have enough time to prepare more, but uh, you know, these are the kinds of ideas that we really need to be discussing. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Great, that's great. Thanks. Thank you. you. Okay. Merry Talk Christmas. to you sometime soon. Same Merry to you. Holidays. Bye. Bye. Ciao.